Welcome to the course Algorithmic Design Lattices. We will basically show you some research that I can, I'm currently working on. It's part of my PhD research and um, graphs appear again, or so kind of um, um, the idea is to describe lattices uh, through, through basically graphs. So I'll show you a little bit kind of thinking there, but it, essentially when we were doing dynamic relaxation uh, script, uh, the way we described the nodes and kind of this particle spring model, we used already kind of graphs. So we used uh, one of the representations of graphs um, in Python. Um, so here you'll do basically the same thing. I just kind of put it a bit nicer in the presentation. Okay, so the topic um, of lattices and space frames. Um, so as I'm kind of writing now about these things, uh, turns out that, um, uh, you know, that there's a, definition of what a lattice is in mathematics um, then in material science um, in um, chemistry physics and in architecture so these lattices are uh, usually uh, we usually refer to them as kind of uh, regular tilings of space or so somehow um, basically space frames or um, in that sense material arranged in a in a regular way uh, so it's in that sense similar to crystal. And if you ask me exactly kind of the difference between a crystal and a lattice, I, I would not be able to tell you exactly, but basically space frames of course appear in architecture. Um, a lot, they are a very efficient system to uh, efficient structural system to uh, span space. So we uh, are able to create very lightweight structures with uh, space frames. Um, it's somehow the, yeah, the kind of, if you're smart, how you distribute the loads and how you um, how you kind of distribute the material around the structure, you can actually uh, create a very lightweight structure, even though it's produced from rather a heavy material. So steel is, you know, quite dense, but it's also very strong. So if you're smart how we distribute it, we can create um, very lightweight structures or something similar is valid also for, uh, for wood. And so this is an example of, this is the uh, USAF, USAF uh, aircraft hangar by Konrad Waxman. So already 70 years ago, um, one of the examples that is, that is always shown uh, kind of when it comes to sort of large, uh, basically space frames in architecture. Also examples that, uh, example that I like to use always. Uh, and then it turns out that kind of lattices are used also in, uh, um, on many different scales. So this is an example of a ultra light micro lattice. Um, and you can follow them. You can actually get them. Uh, there's the reference to the paper here. Uh, it was published in science, uh, science Journal. And it's basically the fabrication method is also kind of quite interesting. Um, it's this kind of, uh, yeah, it's basically um, done through um, curing a photopolymer. So it's not 3D printing, but there's a kind of a trick how you can create a lattice in a photopolymer by using kind of a template. Um, and, and then this enables you to create really fine micro lattices. You can then coat them in, uh, I think here it's coated in some metal. It's, I'm not sure if it's zinc or copper. And um, yeah, then the, you can, um, they have actually, quite some um, interesting material properties. So they're actually quite, they are very light, almost like kind of microfoams and, uh, and very light and very strong bar. So kind of in the material research lattices are also used or uh, being, uh, this is a very, um, uh, it's, it's a on a kind of developing research field. Uh, okay, so we kind of have space frames and lattices and they're basically in a way the same thing, just on two, two different scales. Okay, so, and then, when we talk about modeling lattices, or we can talk about um, basically drawing wireframe models in a computer. <clears throat> and this is um, part of the paper that was uh, that I published in uh, or quartered in um, in December, um, which is uh, deals with uh, machine learning and parametric augmentation of wireframe models. Or so you basically have um, you on the left you can see like a wireframe model. It's specifically like a castle. And um, then what we did is we developed this sort of parametric augmentation or so if we look at this lattice or this wireframe model as a, um, as a data kind of point, then we can sort of augment that data point or so we can kind of create different versions of that model uh, using 
parametric design or so basically we just write an algorithm um, that kind of draws the same lattice over and over but in different um, where we kind of change different uh, parameters so you know the sizes uh, size of the size the, the kind of what do you have here uh, the thickness of the uh, thickness of the uh, of this structure floor height width length and the total number of floors or so these are some parameters that we can change and this was done then in Python. So um, basically this enables us then to create many versions of the same model. And yeah, this is what we call parametric augmentation because in machine learning, there's a technique called data augmentation where you kind of go, you can kind of augment or increase the number of data points that you work with. And you can do this for images. And here we did it basically with, um, uh, with 3D uh, lattices. Uh, so this is another model, um, the the CCT, CCTV uh, tower. Um, so this is kind of a wireframe model of it, also parametrically augmented. Uh, and yeah, and then basically this, um, with just having these two parametric models, you can create a data set of, you know, um, however many uh, models you want and then this can be a good start for uh, training a neural network for example so the context of this research is basically um, machine learning on 3d data and again you can go on the uh, i can maybe give you a link later uh, also to you can get i think the whole paper online uh, just only that it's pdf but i'll actually also put it on our on our reading folder as well so the paper is called Generation of Geometric Interpolations of Building Times with Deep Variational Autoencoders. It was just published uh, end of last year. Okay, so this is a variational autoencoder. So it's a deep neural network. Um, and um, I will talk a little bit more about machine learning in some future uh, lectures. I actually don't really have so many, I guess maybe next week. Um, but it's basically a, a deep neural network and we kind of feed the data sets, the training sets, um, on this case on the left on one on the input layer and um, the network is kind of through this bottleneck is learning the so-called latent uh, representation uh, of these two individual data sets and basically merges them and uh, then it's trying to use this latent representation which is like a compressed representation of the models of the whole kind of data set it's trying to use that to reconstruct uh, them from scratch so it's a basically um, you would kind of wonder why would you want to create a, basically a machine that is um, first, you know, <clears throat> compressing something or sort of destroying something and then reconstructing this, the same thing. And the measure of success is how well is the reconstruction done. So in a sense, you know, the more efficient way would of course be to just copy. Uh, but the point here is that in this latent layer in the middle, there's learning happening or so the network is basically learning what are the defining features, um, high level features of these uh, geometries that are coming in. And, um, and then when the network learns that, of course, if, that's, if that succeeds, then uh, you can actually use, you don't need the input anymore, or you can just use the latent layer to reconstruct, to basically generate different instances of these wireframe models. And uh, because they exist on the, this latent space, they are kind of superimposed or they kind of exist in the same um, in the same space in a way they're mapped onto the same latent space then you can create continuous um, interpolations between them they're in a way hybrids or so you it's a way to hybridize two models or in this case two lattices uh, together um, okay so these are some sample outputs of that uh, uh, of that network mm. unfortunately I think in this present uh, in this example here the vertical lines are missing it's just a glitch from from rhino but uh, the vertical lines should also be here and okay so these are some um, some examples so basically then what you're able to do you can basically sample that space it's the same as we did here and i just did it here kind of with with, their, uh, with rendering so you can go from one model in this case the castle model and you can sort of continuously interpolate to the CCTV tower here, or so in a way you're creating a machine that that can give can give you sort of different hybrids of these two data sets. Of course, here we used only two. Um, ideally, we would use, of course, a lot more. And um, yeah, okay. And then there's a way to kind of fabricate these. Some just some small tests that we did with uh, 
a powder printer um, some years ago. And of course you can, there's a different way to print or to express these lattices. So this is just a kind of a powder printed model. Um, and this is a special extruded or so you kind of go, uh, so this, we did this 2015 with the students. Um, basically is a thermoplastic polymer. I think it was ooh, what they build Legos from ABS. Um, it's kind of white and then you basically, um, yeah, you can kind of extrude in space. So it's a kind of a technique uh, where you don't need to, you can print sort of in space without using supports. And even this shape here was actually printed without using supports. Also in a way you can um, then fabricate these lattices um, based on these models. Okay, so I already touched upon a little bit this topic of 3D machine learning. Uh, so it's basically machine learning from um, uh, on, on kind of on big data or on data sets. Uh, and specifically here, we talk about geometric uh, machine learning. So learning on 3D uh, geometry. Uh, and then these can be, so this geometry can be represented in different ways like point clouds, volumetric, um, like voxels, for example, polygonal meshes, multi-view images, or kind of some kind of primitive base. So these are the uh, techniques that are used. And then kind of the next step of this uh, wireframes that basically was playing around a little bit with polygonal meshes. So this is one example. Um, so the meshes in a way, so the mesh that you, you, know, you use in Rhino to render, um, it's in a way also a lattice in a way. So it's a 2D manifold, uh, but it has a very specific topology. It's basically a surface. So you can go from one surface, one mesh surface, like a sphere in this case, to in, uh, in our case, the kind of a, um, this castle model. Or so you can kind of map from one to the other one. And this is done uh, to using 3D loss functions. Or so they are very basic when it comes to uh, machine learning on, uh, on, on data. You always have a loss function that is basically telling you how far away you are from, uh, from the desired result. You can use this to basically uh, do these transformations. And here you can see, this is kind of going from a torus to the, to the castle model. You can see something weird is happening. There's kind of a line. It's, it's just because the way these meshes are defined in, um, in CAD programs are. So um, this seam actually ex exists in a torus when you create a mesh, um, the torus mesh in Rhino, this seam kind of exists. You just don't see it because the edges are kind of um, uh, closed. But um, <clears throat> in this uh, reconstruction, basically, this seam somehow opened um, because, of course, the um, surface of the sphere and surface of the donut have a different genus. Um, so they are topologically different. This one is the surface of the hole, and you cannot really do a continuous transformation from one to the other one without doing the cuts or, so that's why these, uh, these seams here exist. Okay, um, and so pol polygonal meshes, um, that's kind of one way to go, um, but my research specifically uh, focuses on lattices, which is sort of um, a combination between like volumetric representation of data and polygonal meshes, um, but maybe something in between. And then, um, the research questions now that I'm kind of tackling or writing about is basically our lattices uh, just embedded graphs. Or so what does that mean? We have graphs um, which basically uh, encode topology or so relationship between objects and specifically objects are um, vertices or, or nodes. So basically points, but point is, uh, you know, uh, we should really just talk about nodes, like nodes in a graph, not about points, because point is an um, object that, ha that has coordinates in space. Or in, in graph, we we talk about nodes because these 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 nodes don't really have a location in space. Or uh, so there's just just topology. Or so we just talk about relationships between different nodes in a graph, and then these graphs can be represented in different ways, um, and we can use in a way we can define graph operations. So some operations on these graphs, meaning the way to modify the graphs. Um, and that's sort of a, in a way a grammar or so a way to, yeah, to kind of modify the graphs or kind of um, use them for modeling, let's say. 
and uh, then we can add the geometry to it. So add the, through uh, basically embedding the graph. Or so when we embed the graph in space, we add geometric information and we basically get a lattice. Or so in a way, if you have graph operations uh, and graph embedding, we in a way define a lattice grammar. Or, and um, I'll maybe mm, try to explain it even more in better or so graph types and representation. So yeah, when we talk about graphs, we usually draw them like this. So we just kind of uh, draw the nodes and the edges uh, between the nodes or so. Um, uh, the edges show the connectivity of the graph or, but this graph here is shown on like a small cube, but this is already in a way a embedding or a drawing of a graph or because you um, basically the only thing that the graph is defined through are these, um, these kind of B, C and D or so we can, show it through a, a, a adjacency matrix, looks like this. So we have all the nodes here, seven or actually eight nodes here uh, and eight nodes here. So basically we show the connection of every, uh, every node to every other node. And um, of course, you know, if zero, if node zero is connected to node seven, then node uh, seven is connected to node zero as well. So this metric is also uh, symmetric. There's a diagonal here. Uh, where uh, the nodes are like we have only black, so we have only kind of filled uh, cells here uh, because every node is in a way also connected to itself. Or so the diagonal diagonal here is black, um, and then it's symmetric because um, this is an underacted uh, graph. Or so again, if one if zero is connected to seven, then seven is also connected uh, to zero. There is no distinction, distinction between these. Another way to represent the graph is using this uh, adjacency list. And that's basically how we do it in Rhino. So in Rhino, when we create um, this node class and we uh, fill it into the network class, we basically have this, uh, yeah, more or less. Uh, so that's kind of the representation that, that, that we use. We have kind of another list that stores all the nodes and then these nodes store the neighbors or which are kind of references to other nodes in the same list. And there's another way to show it. So it's called so-called edge set where you're not focusing on the nodes themselves, but basically on the, on the edges. So this would be edge zero one, which is the edge that connects node zero and one. Or so there's a kind of three different uh, representations of the kind of same thing, or and this is just the drawing of the graph on the left. Okay, so there are different types of graphs. So um, which is not really that important, but um, kind of uh, um, just important to know that uh, sometimes are you know so common that they are already defined, so they have a name and there might also be a, um, kind of a specific notation for it. So this is, for example, a path graph. Uh, this is a cycle graph. Uh, what is this piece? A planar graph. Uh, that means that we can kind of unfold it in a way in the plane that um, no. Uh, no lines cross and here of course they cross but we can actually unfold this one so that they don't cross and it's not really evident but uh, this is actually possible for this specific graph here then there are those uh, so-called bipartite graphs so the graph that kind of has um, nodes uh, can be nodes can be split into different groups and there's no connection between the nodes um, in the same group but only between the groups so if you look at for example a neural network um, deep neural network, um, different neurons and neurons in different layers, they have these relationships uh, here. Uh, yeah. Then this is the so-called tree graph. Uh, it's a bit hard to see how this is a tree, but I'll show you some other ones uh, where it's more clear. Um, so it's, uh, you can create it with the L system, let's say, and this is so-called complete graph. So where every node has um, connection to every other node. And yeah, these are the small, uh, these are the small um, uh, adjacency matrices or for each, each of these. Okay, so again, some named graphs. So uh, some graphs actually have names and in mathematics, these are then used to, uh, to kind of define, the, uh, to define these, uh, these graphs. And they are basically almost like kind of building blocks. Okay, then we can define graph operations in a way graph grammars. So these are the elementary graph edit operators. Um, so I listed here six of them. So you know, vertex insertion, vertex deletion, 
uh, we can delete them. Uh, we can actually, this is, uh, this is adding an edge, this is deleting an edge. And then there are some composite um, operations like uh, edge splitting. So we can kind of add, we can sort of split one edge. So add a node and add one edge or edge contraction, or we can kind of remove one edge um, and remove one node at the same time. Um, and these are then the corresponding sort of what sort of happens with the adjacency matrix here, you can see. Okay, then there are so-called unary graph operations, which basically take, uh, they just take one graph and they just transform it. So um, um, we have initial graph and then we have the kind of uh, operation and then we just have, uh, we have final graph. So we can define a so-called complement graph. Um, this is so-called line graph, so kind of relation between the edges. This is the so-called dual graph, which is possible to do only for planar graphs. Um, then some other operations are, for example, graph products. So th there we need two graphs. So if we would uh, basically do a product of two graphs. Uh, so um, for example, this is the so-called disjoint union or kind of a sum of graphs. It's just they're not really connected together, they're separate, but we can then define a so-called Cartesian product. Uh, this is a tensor product, strong product, which is kind of a combination between the tensor and Cartesian. And then there are some other ones a bit more exotic, like uh, lexicographic product and rooted product. Or so we can, if you have two graphs, which is, we can sort of um, define products on them. So we can kind of combine them together. And to show you basically, what does that mean? Uh, for example, a, a Cartesian product is very convenient because it means that we can sort of start with simple graphs uh, and we can create in this sense sort of like a three-dimensional structure of question until they're embedded, they're not really, there's no dimension to them or they're just, they can just be shown flat. Uh, but basically when we embed them in three-dimensional space, they, they go from maybe being um, sort of, you know, line graphs to being kind of flat sort of surfaces or being, um, being kind of three-dimensional lattices or so this we can do with the, Cartesian product, for example, and there are some other operations that we can do like graph com compositions or we can sort of glue them, glue the graphs um, together. Or so this is the so-called series graph composition, this is the parallel composition, and this is the Hirsch uh, kind of cons construction, which is a bit specific, but you can also do it. Okay, and then, not, okay, we have graphs and then now we want to, uh, we have operations on them so we can construct different graphs from more elementary ones. And, but we still don't have lattices or so in order to get a lattice, we need to embed the graph in space. And then um, here I kind of outlined, you know, graph embedding can sort of understand it as, as lattice form finding or, um, and then there are different ways to do this graph embedding. And like one of them is a spectral method, which I will not show here. It's also part of my research. Um, but I'll show you an, uh, the so-called force density graph layout method. And that's the one that we will also code in Python or that I will show you in Python. We basically already kind of did it more or less uh, in this dynamic realization script. Okay, so it means that we have a, we define nodes uh, of the graph and we, we embed them in a way approximately in space. Usually we would do it by um, putting the nodes in the space randomly or so we just define a bounding box and you just put them randomly um, just put them on random points in the space uh, and that that's kind of how we start so basically we we sort of force the geometry onto onto a graph okay but but locations are sort of arbitrary or they're random but the connections between the nodes are not random they come from a uh, from the adjacency matrix or that's something that we um, that we defined before. Okay, and then we basically create, um, uh, we create like a particle spring model or so we basically say, oh, there's a repulsive force that acts between all the, um, all the nodes or so the nodes are basically trying to um, move away from each other. Uh, but there is sort of a cutoff distance or so once when the, when the neighboring nodes are too far away, uh, we flip the force, so we kind of uh, introduce an attractive force. Um, and the repulsive force, we can define it in a way that we say it falls with the square of the distance. So when the, um, uh, when the um, 
uh, when the nodes kind of move away far away from each other, the, this force, this repulsive force becomes kind of weaker and weaker, uh, but the attractive force sort of becomes stronger. Um, and then basically these two forces or these two sets of forces, they uh, kind of theories, they sort of balance each other out. So at one moment, the um, nodes assume sort of an equilibrium position. So they kind of uh, um, 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 assume like a fixed distance uh, between each other and they basically form a three-dimensional lattice or if you do it in three-dimensional space, then it's a 3D lattice or so. Um, and this combination of having repulsive forces and um, attractive forces in a way simulates rigid edges uh, between adjacent vertices or nodes. Um, and again, when we did the dynamic relaxation script, we did exactly this, except we only had uh, attraction forces. We didn't have repulsion. We only had attraction. Then of course, everything wanted to kind of clump into one point, but then we defined some points as kind of being fixed in space. So um, they, it, it was not possible for all of them to kind of clump into space. So we had this sort of a minimal surface between them. So here we have a very similar situation, but there are no fixed nodes. They're all allowed to move. And we have kind of attraction and repulsion. Okay. And then the theory goes that we can sort of define a graph through its adjacency matrix. And, um, and then we can use this, um, again, this uh, force based uh, layout method to basically find how this lattice looks like. And again, um, there are usually every graph has um, multiple different embeddings. So you can embed it in different ways. And then um, again, it, from my research, it was not really clear if this is really also possible, like in a three-dimensional space, is, that, is it then possible that uh, every single lattice can kind of form or every single, or, or kind of every graph, can we get different three-dimensional embeddings? This is not clear, but in my simulations, usually the, we would always get one or so there's a little bit maybe more that I have to look into there, but basically we can get a sort of stable uh, configuration. Okay, so I promised you that I will show you uh, how a tree looks like. So this is a tree graph. This is the adjacency matrix that I drew by hand back in the day for a tree graph. You can see that it's uh, just a line. And this is a possible embedding of, um, of that uh, lattice. Um, and here it says kind of matrix is not shown in full R. So this is, um, um, I think this is 10 iterations. So you can kind of calculate three to the power of 10. Uh, that's the number of kind of, nodes that you have here. Okay, so we can have, the, the idea is that um, uh, if the graph has a lot of vertices or a lot of nodes, then it's embedding in space can be actually very complicated or it can be kind of very, uh, very, very complex. It can kind of define a very complex, uh, complex lattice or, but basically the adjacency matrix is very simple here. You can see it uh, on the left, but kind of embedding is very complex. Okay, this is another one. So these are basically, as you remember, uh, already we, di uh, we did this. With, um, these are examples from the uh, 3D tree that we did with, when we did the L systems. Or so this was kind of a free branch. It's again not exactly evident that it is a tree, but it actually is. <laughs> it's just very regular. And here is uh, maybe a bit more familiar kind of a canopy, like tree ca canopy, uh, with sort of four four branches. Or but it's also kind of a tree. So this model and this model are actually the same. Um, so they're, they are very similar, uh, but uh, they have different different em embeddings or so em embedding of a lattice does matter. Okay, and this is the only reason why I was using PowerPoint in the first place. So yeah, you can kind of demonstrate the principle um, on sort of simple lattices. So here we have a adjacency, adjacency matrix for this sort of, it's basically a cube and then we can, um, simulate its unfolding or, and we can do the same thing. This is a different, uh, it's also a cube, but all the edges are triangulated. So there are also eight vertices and, uh, and we basically get this kind of a, <clears throat> I don't know what this is, kind of a double tetrahedron or something like that. Okay, and this is basically what we will do in Rhino uh, today. So the code does this already. And I tried it just yesterday with, larger lattices and it works also for larger ones. So at least on my computer. Okay, um, and just to show a little bit kind of how, like what is the, you know, these are gonna be very simple examples we will do, but 
we'll try to do a little bit more complex examples. And there, um, the question is, well, how do we, you know, how do we define a JCC matrix or do we kind of draw it ourselves? Like, you know, because this is simple to sort of define by yourself, but when you want to um, work with sort of more complex graphs, then the question is, where is this data coming from? So we will be using a data from, I think here it's written, uh, from this kind of University of Florida sparse matrix collection. Um, and we'll go on their website and we'll basically grab these sparse matrices. And again, that's a bit of a story. You can actually have a uh, look at the lecture from uh, Margaret Gerritsen. She's a professor at Stanford and computer science, I guess. Uh, she has this wonderful lecture called Linear, Al Linear Algebra, the Incredible Beauty of Math from 2013 where basically just explains uh, what I will show you now in the next few slides. So in a way, uh, sparse matrices are, are called sparse because they so in a way show, um, ah, they kind of show, uh, so it's a large matrix um, that is basically representing systems of partial, differ partial differential equations. Uh, and, you know, these are, this is a system of partial differential equations here on the left, an example of a system. And you can sort of, um, because some terms are left out, you can kind of define sort of a matrix uh, where the zero terms basically are, um, uh, they're, they're just not put in. And only the ones, only the kind of uh, uh, real value or kind of a, um, or how are they called? Yeah, this, the, the terms that are there, they have a usually a coefficient, a coefficient in front of them. And uh, they are in that sense in a matrix maybe represented as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of a dot or so. And if you look at the kind of whole matrix, then you can look a little bit like this or so. Those are basically um, a, a way to, so there's a kind of whole field in mathematics, I guess kind of applied mathematics that is sort of researching the properties of these, uh, sparse matrices and their relations to, to these partial differential equations, which are used for simulating all kinds of stuff. Okay, and then uh, in this research uh, from Timothy Davis and uh, Yifan Hu, uh, they basically took uh, these matrices and they started, um, they started sort of visualizing them using uh, force density methods. So exactly what I showed you just before. So you kind of, again, start with the matrix and you kind of define you know, nodes and connections between nodes. And then you sort of simulate the configuration. And then for every matrix, you could get a different, um, different lattice out. Or so basically, again, exactly what I showed you. Uh, these guys did it just way, way better than me. Um, but yeah. And these are maybe the best examples. So I'll uh, we'll show you some. Um, so we will basically what we'll try to do today, we will uh, try to get these, these matrix data from the website, we'll parse it into Python, we'll basically do the, do the same thing. So we'll kind of recreate uh, what, they, what they did here um, as well. Uh, but yeah, we'll work a little bit, maybe smaller, smaller lets, maybe 100 nodes or something like that. Okay, so they're kind of different. These are basically all the different structures that you can get um, by, by kind of um, yeah, interpreting Again, adjacency matrices as as graphs, and then interpreting or embedding these graphs into three dimensional space. Also, there's a kind of a connection between all of these topics. Okay, and this is the last project that I will show. The Aval House is um this is um this is actually a real just a kind of a built project that um, um and the studio did um which was I think finished last year more or less last year in summer. We already got uh, kind of nominated for this um, EU uh, Miss van der Rohe award. But this of course, uh, you know, uh, they have to skip one year because of um, pandemic. So um, there's like, I think 400 projects that were nominated. So, and then there's gonna be a short list next year, but basically um, this project got now a little bit of exposure. Um, but this kind of project also started way, way before some, some years ago. Um, and this is actually how it started. So it's basically, it's basically um, so it's a house, but it's a, it's a space frame. Also going a little bit back to the first, first image in this lecture, um, the cornered boxman's uh, sort of um, this aircraft hangar. Here we basically have, in a way, a very similar structure, but of course, much smaller. 
Um, th this is just um, kind of a steel, um, steel, steel frame, steel spatial frame. And um, yeah, kind of the house is organized here. You can see a floor plan. You can kind of walk around and it's on a hill. You can see a little bit kind of it's on a hill. Um, so there's kind of a concrete pillar that holds everything. And, um, and yeah, when you kind of think about, well, of course, this is a steel structure. So it's obvious that you can uh, simulate, you know, it's um, structural behavior in this case very easily because uh, again, these, um, uh, these steel frames or they are basically, um, they, are all, they basically act like, a, act like a lattice. So they are quite thin. So um, this is, a, I think, a FEM a model, uh, but it's basically, again, you could do this with um, code that we have in Rhino or you simulate a rigid lattice uh, and you can sort of, um, well, not, not, not exactly, but you can sort of, um, maybe if you use Karamba in Grasshopper, uh, uh, you can actually, uh, you can simulate the sort of structural behavior of this lattice. Or so somehow lattices are, um, in a way, have, I think, quite a lot of, or potential, a lot of applications in, you know, arch architectural projects, even on sort of smaller scale. So they're not just for, um, you know, large kind of, Hole, spanning holes and so on. Um, so even in maybe smaller projects, they can be they can be useful. 